Most football fans and historians know the famous 1941 film from Hollywood titled Newt Rockney, All-American. The film had a segment in where Coach Rockney inspired his fighting Irish players to come back at halftime in a game against Army in 1928. The rousing speech had the legendary coach firing up the juices of his players by telling them to go out there and win one for the Gipper. But just who was the Gipper? And why did the men respond so well to his memory? We have his story coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And we are going to peer through the football portal today to go back to one of the greatest Notre Dame stories and legends of all times. It's the win one for the Gipper story that Newt Rockney. Uh, portrayed in a, a famous movie, uh, or at least an actor portrayed in a famous movie about Newt Rockney called Newt Rockney All American in 1941. But before we get to the Gipper story, let's uh, talk about how you can get some great football information on history each and every day of the week, each and every day of the year, as a matter of fact. If you go to the uh, pigskindispatch.com website. There is up in the upper banner, there is an email subscription button. Click on that, fill in two fields, your name, your email address, and every day, 6.30 a.m. Eastern, you will receive a great newsletter that we provide that has everything new that's coming out on Pigskin Dispatch, the Sports Jersey Dispatch, Orville Mulligan, and the Sports History Network. Absolutely free. It takes seconds to do it. You only have to sign up once, and uh, you'll have that information each and every day, knowing what's going on on the podcast and on the websites, uh, and get some great uh, football knowledge each and every day. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Pigskin Dispatch, and Facebook, we have the Pigskin Dispatch page. You can send your feedback to email to us. We'll answer each and every one. Pigskindispatch at gmail.com is that address. Now, let's get to our feature story of the day. Now, most football fans and historians Historians know that the famous 1941 film that we talked about earlier, uh, Newt Rockney All-American, the film had that segment where coach Newt Rockney inspired his fighting Irish players to come back at halftime in a game against Army in 1928. The rousing speech had the legendary coach firing up the juices of his players by telling him the famous line of, win one for the Gipper. And we'll get more into that exact line in a few moments here. And the Gipper was a former player of the squad that had passed away a few years earlier with Rockney at his bedside. And in the movie, Gip was portrayed by a young future president of the United States who was an actor at the time, Ronald Reagan. Uh, Yeah, to that line, many of us uh, know for Win One for the Gipper is the only reference that anyone really knows about, you know, who Gip was. So who was George Gipp, and why did his great coach want players of the future to remember him and rally in his honors? Well, those are the questions that we hope to answer here in this podcast episode. Now, George Gipp was born on February 18, 1895, near the mining town of Laurium, Michigan. His father was a local minister. And young George was an exceptional all-around high school athlete. He was a fullback at the University of Notre Dame eventually. And the National Football Foundation's website tells us that in his four varsity years, Gip rushed for 2,341 yards. That's a school record that lasted all the way till 1978. Think about all the great backs that played uh, between that time of 1920 and 1978. You know, four Horsemen comes to mind. Uh, Paul Hornig comes to mind. And many other greats. Uh, but Gip had that record. He also completed 93 passes for 1,769 yards, punted, returned kicks, and scored 156 points, counting touchdowns, extra points, and field goals. Okay, that sounds all well and good, you know, great stats, but, you know, we have a lot of players that have some phenomenal stats, but their coaches don't 
tell them to, hey, let's go out there and win one for, for this guy that had great stats. No, there's more to this story, and we're going to get into that right now. Now, Gip, uh, though, uh, prior to the meeting of Rockney and attending Notre Dame, really had no interest in playing the game of football. He was an outstanding athlete, like we said, in many sports, and he attended the school in South Bend on scholarships for baseball, track, and basketball. There was no football uh, even mentioned there because he had never played the game organized on the gridiron prior to that, and he really had no interest in doing it. He loved his hoops, he loved running track, and he loved playing baseball. But one afternoon in the late summer, just as school was starting, Gip was out on the grounds of Notre Dame with some of his buddies, you know, in between classes, doing what young guys do, goofing around, tossing the old pigskin around, just having some fun. And, uh, you know, he was in street clothes. Uh, and New Rockney happened to be walking by, not paying much attention to the recreational activity of the youngsters, because it was always going on on a nice uh, warm day in the fall, you know, kids are out just uh, you know burning some steam off of after being in classes all day but what caught Rockney's attention was a couple thuds of the football a sound he was extremely familiar with after playing and coaching for as long as he did and he sat and he caught wind of what was going on and sort of caught his attention he sat there and watched this young man in street clothes George Gipp taking the football and drop kicking it and the ball was carrying, you know, in his, in Rockney's estimation, some 60 some yards in the air. I mean, a tremendously strong leg and boots and the you know, almost perfect form in doing so. So Rockney, you know, it really caught his interest now. Now he had to go talk to this young man. And, you know, the great salesman that Rockney was and spokesman for the game of football, he was very convincing and eventually talked Gip into coming out for the football team uh, of Notre Dame. And what a great uh, start to a relationship that was. Well, in 1916 was the year, and they sort of threw him an old uniform because the team was already started. And one game he entered into, well, his first game that he played, was against the Western Normals. And in that game, Gip ended up kicking and scoring on a 63-yard drop kick field goal. Then the balance of his collegiate gridiron debut went a little bit poorly that first season as he soon uh, Gip broke his leg and his season was over. Well, season number two for Gip, he played a couple games and then left the team to join the U.S. military to fight in World War I. So Rockney, of course, understood this. He was a, you know, a hero for, for doing that, just like all the other young men and women that were, were leaving their families and regular lives to, to go fight the war in Europe, the Great War it was. And, s and soon after the fighting in Europe was over, though, Gip returned to campus, as promised, to resume his gridiron career, much to the delight of Newt Rockney and the Notre Dame faithful. He was an unbelievable player. He stood at just six foot tall, weighed 175 pounds, and the athletic George Gipp proved to be a formidable force in college football. He was unmatched as a player by anyone of his time as he could throw. He was extremely quick and fast. He could drop kick you know, some distances like we talked about just a few minutes ago. He could cut back on a dime or running with a ball and left many a defender in the dust and his leg though was the true weapon, as he was known to nail drop kick field goals from some 65 yards out. We already know he kicked a 63 yarder in a game. Gip was a phenom at football. He once rushed for 332 yards in a single game. That's pretty darn good. And Gip though was a young man, and with that he had a sense of adventure and sort of had to sow his wild oats and wanted to experience the most out of life. He had a real zest for life and adventure. And sometimes this got George Gipp into a little bit of trouble, partaking into a couple uh, questionable escapades off the field with the zest. Uh, a few of them even put him in some maybe trouble with the law or some precarious situations that Newt Rockney himself had to rescue him from. Now Gipp would repay his guardian angel coach with some of the greatest feats the gridiron has ever seen. One of these was in Gipp's final collegiate game in November of 1920, where Gipp really showed his loyalty to his coach and the team. Now, it was a cold and snowy game 
uh, that day in the late November 1920, and the Irish were up against what was possibly their biggest test of the season when they faced off against the undefeated Northwestern Wildcats in South Bend. Uh, and they were from Northwestern, of course, is from nearby Chicago. A Gip was a little bit under the weather that day, suffering from a severe cold. And Rockney, it said, had told him to stay home and get better, not even come to the game. But Gip showed up anyway and suited up. You know, got all his uniform on. The wise coach uh, played along with it, and he intended to keep his star player on the bench the entire game, not letting him play to further hurt himself. Well, the game was close all day, as, uh, you know, would be with an undefeated team and you know, one of the other top teams in the nation. And with just minutes remaining, Notre Dame got the ball back, and they were trailing by a score. The Irish needed to capitalize on this drive as time was running out, and a touchdown was the only way that they could do to get ahead on the scoreboard. Well, the crowd was going into a frenzy, and they were up in the stands cheering for Gip to enter the game. Many could see him on the sidelines all game. They couldn't figure out why Rockney wasn't playing him. They didn't know about his illness. Well, Gip was inspired by the cheers and the whole frenzy of the game and the drama that was building up on the scoreboard with time running out. Only a few plays left where Notre Dame could complete this drive. Could they score to get up on the Northwestern Wildcats or would the Wildcat defense hold on and just win this game for them? Well, the drama was going into a crescendo. And finally, after much resistance, Rockney reluctantly succumbed to the pleads of Gip and the crowd, and they put him in as a substitute in the game. Now, there's only time for a couple of plays, but the final play that Gip played in was truly spectacular, as described by many sources that were there. Now, Gip took a handoff and used the interference of his blockers to perfection. Now, he zigged and zagged, broke tackles, and ended up scoring on one of the most unbelievable broken field runs of his career. Quite a way to end one's football career uh, the, with the scoring an unexpected touchdown after sitting all day ill and winning the game for your team on that final play. The play and Gip uh, being at the frigid, miserable weather game, but it it really took a toll, though, on Gip's body. Gip was hospitalized in critical condition only days later with streptococcal throat infection and pneumonia were the prognosis, and the entire student body of South Bend knelt outside in vigilance of George Gip's hospital window in the snow as the young fullback lay dying. He was, wasn't even 25 years old at the time. And Coach Newt Rockney stayed faithful to his star player and was at Gipp's bedside the entire time. It's no wonder that a talent such as George Gipp, the legendary Notre Dame coach Rockney, would remember Gipp's last words to him as Gipp laid in the hospital bed dying. And Gipp said this, quote, Someday, Rock, when a team is up against it, when things are going bad and the brakes are beating the boys, Tell them to go in there with all they've got and just win one for the Gipper. And I don't know where I'll be there then, Rock, but I'll know about it and I'll be happy. Unquote. Now, Newt used these words some eight years after Gip's death in 1928 game against Army. The Irish were down by six at halftime in the locker room, but Rockney's plea from the dear departed Gip roused the Irish to a 12 to 6 comeback victory that may never be forgotten. We're remembering it almost 100 years later. For years after that, even after Rockney's untimely death, the fighting Irish were said to rally from certain defeat many times in the spirit of George Gip's final message to the team he played for. He was said to be the ghostly 12th man that helped guide the Irish to many a victory and many of those in comebacks at uh, really uh, dramatic times during the game. With the, you know, the great play of you know, George Gipp, the National Football Foundation selected Gipp for entrance into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1951. Now, truly a, a very resonating story, and we, especially and we know it, mean, the words mean a lot more when one for the Gipper when we know who the Gipper was. And that's a legendary Notre Dame Irish uh, player, 
George Gipp, that we remember this day. Hey, thanks again for joining us on this uh, little bit of history of football. And we do this each and every day. We talk about uh, some aspect of football history, sometimes multiple ones. We have uh, multiple posts some days. Uh, we told you how to join our email subscription so you get a newsletter in each and every day. Absolutely free. It doesn't cost anything, but just put in your name and your email address. If you follow the show note link to do that or go to pigskindispatch.com. Till tomorrow, everybody, have a great gridiron day. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order.